it's an honor for me to be here. I, I mean, I never thought I'd be back at MIT giving a lecture. So I'd like to thank uh, many people who are responsible for that, and, and many of them are in this room right now. Okay, so MIT, then I worked in a lot of corporate, big corporate world. And I moved more from technical into management. And I was working with the US government, and I was running a large satellite program, and um, I ended up in California because I found California to be a little bit different than Washington, D.C., and New Jersey. It's like a little more open, spirited. People were more concerned about technology. Whereas in the East Coast, I found politics were, had, were forming a large component of, of life. So I, I went out there, and I was very happy about that. And I worked through many years. I did also some teaching here or there in computer science, and a little bit of teaching in astronomy. Helped write a couple books along the way, so I always try to keep my fingers in some partially academic pursuits. And then in 2015, a friend of mine and I decided to form this company, which we named IQ. And it was based on an MIT technology. So it's all more fitting that I'm back here at MIT talking about an MIT technology. And I'll talk about how we got it and, and some of the people involved with that. Um, we started the company. One year later, we had a product. Here's the product. $30. Go to IQ.com. You can buy it. We accept all credit cards. And in the first four months, we've sold about 9,000 of them. Now let me go into the heart of the talk, which is looking at eye health. So right now, how many people are in the world? About 6.8 billion. Roughly 40% of them need eye correction. It's actually higher than that, because by the time you reach about 45 years old, most people need reading glasses. They may not admit it, but they would do well by having reading glasses. Um, and most people in the world need some kind of correction to the refraction to see clearly. If, it, if you don't correct it, you eventually will have some serious eye problems. You'll go blind. And of course, if you can't read or write, it certainly affects your job prospects, your uh, ability to earn money. So in many places in the world, uh, eye care does not exist. So a technology like this, which there are plenty of smartphones around and a little device could make a big difference. And then internationally, like I said before, it, it's an open field. The world is just flooded with opportunity. And there's thousands, actually millions of people, about 150 million people right now who need glasses in the world who don't have any whatsoever. OK, let me say a word about eyes. At some level, eyes are very easy to understand. It's a lens. And it's a retina it's a, for an imaging surface. Um, typical eye is 17 millimeters. If your eye's working well, your lens is synced up so that the a parallel light beam coming into the eye will focus on retina, will, will converge on retina. And if you have that condition, you have nice normal eyesight. If you don't, there's a problem. And you can just model it. You can compute the diopter for the eye, which is about something at 60 diopters. It's the inverse of uh, the focal length of this little lens here. So when you're thinking about vision correction, if someone's eye is just the focus is off by, say, a millimeter or so, that corresponds to roughly about four diopters in correction. So when you hear, I need four diopters of correction, that means your eyes are focusing about a millimeter off, uh, off the, uh, where it should be. If you're myopic, that means nearsighted. You focus before the retina. Hypero focuses after the retina. So by bringing in, for example, a myopia, a slightly diverging lens, okay, you will basically spread the light out a little bit, and it'll focus back on the retina. So that's basically the game. Uh, there's another aspect which is important to measure, which is astigmatism. Stigmatism is the non-spherical aspect of the eye. So if you have an elliptically shaped cornea, or even the eye lens could be like that, 
then at that point, you need to measure that as well to get a good prescription. So we, we measure all, all of those things. Now, how do you go from a simple little idea to creating a consumer product? There's a lot of requirements, and most companies fail. And I, haven't, I, I don't believe we succeeded yet, but we're, you know, we're in a good place. But it has to be low cost. It's got to be easy to use. Safety is an issue. You know, little kids eat little pieces of things. You have to worry about that. Um, it needs to be accurate. You don't just want to sell something that doesn't work right. If you're promoting something that's a measurement tool, it has to be fairly accurate. It needs to be uh, reliable. In other words, you ship it out, you drop it, it still works. It can't, it can't break. And a tough requirement that we set upon ourselves, it has to work on many different phones. So if we want to sell a lot of them, there's many phones we have to satisfy. And it turns out that there's hundreds of different Android <coughs> phones out there and a fair number of, uh, of iPhones. So we've had to basically get the parameters for each one. So when we operate the system, the user actually gets downloaded a version of the app that corresponds to their phone so that they can make the proper movements. So people told me it's impossible to do this. Forget about it. Just do one phone and try to sell that phone. But we said, no, we're going to try this very ubiquitous approach. And we did. Now, there's lots of constraints, right? You, you don't have infinite money. You don't have infinite time. And talent, you certainly don't have infinite talent. I mean, that's what, probably the biggest challenge in, in these startup companies is getting really good people who will work on some of these things in, in a tough environment. Development. So it took us a year to get there. And how did we get there? So basically, we started playing with pixels. I had. I went to Amazon and I bought a $30 little electronic microscope and I had no idea what to do. And I'm looking at my iPhone and I'm seeing pixels. Then I hired some really smart people. We started playing around with some optics, looking at different approaches. Um, after a few weeks, we had a rubber band model. This was cardboard, rubber band, and a little micro lens array. It worked pretty well. Then we tried different prototypes with different optical approaches. We had about three different optical approaches that we took. We finalized down to there. Lots of testing. And then we had to figure out how to manufacture it at a good price. So we did that basically in a year, which uh, I'm told is a pretty good, pretty good time interval for that kind of thing. We were lucky we didn't make any big mistakes. It's very easy to go off track. I'll go through some of the lessons learned uh, when I wrap up here. So basically, the product is called the Personal Vision Tracker. And you've seen Peter trying to use it, actually using it, I should say. And you know, that helps. And it uses a little bit of um, microsuction tape, so it doesn't damage anything. It's not, a, it's not an adhesive. And you basically look in and create the test. What you'll see when you look in are it's basically lines, two lines. You bring the lines together. The amount of movement corresponds to your refractive error. When red and green come together, you see a yellow line. That's basically the whole, the whole idea. We record that. We, uh, actually, we're doing a lot of data processing because it's not quite that simple. So we have, to, we have some algorithms to remove bad data points. We can also detect who's having trouble using the device, because that's important. We don't want to give out numbers to people who are having trouble using the device. And then they go purchase eyeglasses with that. So we have some methods in place. And that's really where the, where the company is. If you think of IQ, it's actually more of a software company, data management company, than it really is a device company. The device, yeah, it's not easy, but the software is, is the major piece of this. And this is, will form a tremendous uh, intellectual research database. But, and this sounds almost like platitudes, but it is really, really true. Okay, hire like the best people you can and use the best tools. Don't scrimp on cheap freeware in terms of software products. Don't 
hire someone if you can get them for $20,000 or $30,000 less. And the salaries we pay, I mean, I won't get into that here. But uh, it makes a big, tremendous difference. And with software productivity, if you have a good programmer, uh, they can literally do the work of five mediocre programmers. And you don't have all this stuff going on between who, who should do what and this. And you need nice people, too. So developing a corporate culture is really important. And when you get a bad person, like they can really disrupt things. and <laughs> Just everybody starts to get mad and paranoid. And you have to avoid all of that. So the people issue, the tools issue, is, is number one. There's a bit of luck there, but you have to be really good about the people you find. And you have to have a good, good sense. And I think a lot of that's intuitive, but so important. Uh, another thing is you have to listen to your gut instincts and not necessarily take advice from the many experts out there willing to offer you uh, advice. So I was told I couldn't develop this for less than $5 million. Well, I developed it for about $1.2 million. Okay. I had a mechanical engineer I was interviewing, and, and uh, she was re really super competent, a really great uh, background. She understood things. And I told her we had to do this in two months. She literally laughed at me as she walked out of the, the building. Like, it couldn't be done. But we did it in two months. So again, don't necessarily, yeah, the, ex the advice is good, but yeah, it could often be wrong. The other thing is fight feature creep. That is a pernicious element that surrounds all human endeavors. People will want to add a little bit here, a little bit there. And people don't realize that complexity is kind of a, has an exponential impact. So when you add a feature, it, it affects you know, more than one thing, generally. So avoid that. So you want to create another buzzword in the sort of startup world, is you want a minimum viable product. This is a minimum viable product. If we had done all of the things people were suggesting, this would not be here today, that, that's, a, that's for sure. Um, work in stealth mode. And don't get into lots of distractions. Again, I had the luxury having the company was entirely self-funded, so we didn't have to go around pretending about how great we were. And you know, a lot of startup companies, they focus on the backgrounds of the people. We didn't have any of that. We just went and did the work, didn't talk to anybody, and just proceeded to develop it. And then we went out to the world and said, hey, look at what we got after we had it. And then we won the award. We also, we also won, we were nominated for the PRISM Award, the SPIE, it's a photonics organization. We were selected, it's kind of called the optics, the, the Oscars of optics, of photonics. So we were nominated for that with two other companies in the area of bioinformatics. We didn't get the first prize, but it was pretty good. Just again, we came out of nowhere. Um, I almost, we almost had this discussion at lunch. You know, when you think about anything, right, there's always problems that, that will be there. And you can anticipate those problems. Generally, if you know what the problems are, you will anticipate it and solve them. That's nice, but what gets you are all the things that you didn't think about. So generally, and, and no one is smart enough to be able to know all the problems that will come up, but you better be at least smart enough to survive with the, with the un, unexpected problems so that you have solved the expected ones by then. Okay, thank you. Thank you.